Dr. Eugenie Scott, great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in California. I'm a big fan of your work and was lucky enough to see you in London a few years ago during the Darwin Day lectures. Uh, when I spoke to you recently, you were in Croatia, but now you're back in the US. <laughs> so just wondering how your trip was. I know you had mentioned the Croatian Neanderthal sites, but uh, sadly, you didn't have time to visit them, did you? No, unfortunately. Um, Krapina is kind of the most famous of the Neanderthal sites in Croatia. And it was just a little bit too far away for me to get up there in the mm. amount of time that I had available to me. But the conference was great. It's, uh, for those of you who are listening to this in Europe, there's a very uh, hardworking and uh, creative consortium of European scientists who are trying to encourage the understanding of evolution in uh, the general population. It's uh, The group is called EVOKE, E-V-O-K-E. -E. It's a consortium of uh, European scientists and a few communications people who mm. are interested in the same thing I am, uh, which is the public understanding of evolution. You can check them out at evokeproject.org. Uh, very worthwhile group. Maybe you can join them and lend them a hand. Well, you are a retired university professor known for working against the teaching of young earth creationism and ID, so-called intelligent design in schools, and you are the founding executive director of the National Center for Science Education. We'll be talking about creationism and science denial, but before we dive into that, let's just hear about your early years and how you became fascinated by science, anthropology, and evolution. Oh, goodness. Um... I have been interested in science ever since I can remember. Um, I remember as a kid growing up in Minneapolis in Minnesota, uh, going down to a, a vacant lot um, at the end of our block and uh, lying down on the grass and, you know, watching the the insects crawl through the, the ground and, and listening to the birds. And I mean, natural history was always something that I that I had a fascination with. And I always enjoyed science classes in school. And um, mm. I got interested, I learned about anthropology, what anthropology was, from my older sister who brought home a college textbook on anthropology. Uh, I must have been in, I don't know, seventh or eighth grade, something like that. And um, there was this big, thick book that had uh, pictures of uh, recreations of fossil humans. And, boy, I was hooked. I thought this was fascinating. And I asked her, what is this? She said, it's anthropology. So I decided, you know, I, this is something I really wanted to know more about. And uh, I kept that interest in anthropology through high school. And the first class I signed up for in college was an introductory anthropology class. So wow. this has been a long time interest of mine. Hey, Dr. Scott, the world today has better access to knowledge, science, and fact checking than ever before, what with the internet, uh, smartphones, etc. But despite this, creationism, climate change denial, and science denial in general seems to be growing. So is it growing or do we just hear about it more? You know, coming coming from the United States, where the idea of freedom of speech is enshrined in our organizational documents. I mean, it's the, the part of the first of the um, uh, statements in the Bill of Rights is, you know, the Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion or the freedom of speech mm. uh, or the press, etc. And um, so... You know, I hear what you say when you say that there's a tremendous amount of information available on the internet, and boy, don't we love it. It's just wonderful finding out everything that you want to know about anything. Yes. Um, but everybody has that right to express their ideas. And uh, so you get, along with all the wonderful stuff, uh, wonderful information you can find on the internet, you also get the dross. You also get the stuff that's just not true at all. And I really think it's it's essential that 
very early in life, we start teaching kids, not just in school, but at home, you know, your own, how, however early you let your kids get online, you want those kids to be critical consumers of what they find online. Mm -hmm. And there are things that you can teach even younger children. But certainly elementary school teaching, uh, students, high school students, and so forth, uh, to make them more critical consumers of what they find on the internet. And those skills need to be taught early and often. And adults need to have them reinforced as well. I mean, you know, we, we, all, we all like to take in information that is compatible with our values and uh, ideologies and you know I, we all have a natural human tendency to prefer those views that support uh, the ones that we hold dear so you know it, it's a, it's a very tough thing to be a critical thinker it's a very tough thing to look dispassionately at information that um, you come across on the internet when especially if it if it mm -hmm. reinforces your views well, you were involved in the infamous 2005 Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, contesting the use of intelligent design textbooks in the school there, working with witnesses and lawyers, and eventually helping to prove the unlawful use of those books. So have things changed much since the trial, and how have creationists ramped up their efforts in recent years? Well... First of all, Mark, I like to think of that as the famous Kids Miller trial, not the infamous one. I think that's infamous. <laughs> if, if we lost, it would be infamous. Okay, but but we won really big, so it good good for our side. Um, no, I think Kids Miller. Um, Kitzmiller itself was very important in helping to blunt the creationist challenge to. Uh, public school teaching of evolution in the U.S., we knew that there was a, that there were a large number of uh, states and school districts around the country that were just poised to introduce um, Dover-like policies requiring the, the introduction of intelligent design into mm. the, um, the, the curriculum there. And the fact that the the decision in Kitzmiller versus Dover was so firm and so clearly stated, look, this is not science. You cannot argue in the American courts. You cannot argue that there is a secular reason for teaching intelligent design because it is clearly just a mis just a relabeled form of creation science, which is very obviously religious. The fact that intelligent design on the surface is not as obviously religious doesn't make it legal to teach. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we were able to show that this was not something that is appropriate on many levels, uh, not legal also to teach in the American public schools, blunted those efforts to increase the number of Dover-like school districts around the country. Mm. That said, the um, uh, anti-evolution uh, sentiment in the United States uh, continues to be quite strong. Mm. A substantial percentage uh, of the population, not not quite half, fortunately, but you know, a, a fairly good-sized proportion of the American public uh, rejects the idea of evolution and doesn't want its kid, its you know, children to be taught it in the schools. Um, that is not going to change as a result of legal decisions. What the legal decisions can do is keep it from being taught in the public schools, which is very, very important and shouldn't be underestimated. But in order for evolution to be accepted, we need more people, more students to learn it in schools and have it be taught appropriately and properly as as a normal part of science, not as something that you have to tiptoe around or uh, qualify in some manner. And uh, frankly, we need um, more support from the uh, religious community. Um, sure. I, I sometimes joke that there's more evolution taught in Catholic schools than public schools, which is something of an exaggeration. But nonetheless, I mean, you know, Catholics have not had a problem with evolution for, for decades. And it's regularly taught in Catholic parochial schools. Um, 
the problem with teaching of evolution comes from a, an, an unusually conservative form of American Protestantism. It's not traditional Christian theology to interpret the Bible literally, but this is part of um, conservative Protestant Christianity in the United States. And unfortunately, it is spreading to uh, some other countries as a result of uh, uh, Protestant missionary work from the United States. But that said, if uh, Catholics and mainstream Protestants were to speak up more loudly about the acceptability of evolution to their um, to their particular versions of, of Christian theology, we'd be a whole lot better off. And um, we, at NCSC, we have encouraged this for, uh, for for you know since our inception. We we've partnered with uh, religious um, uh, institutions that support. Um, that accept evolution and support its teaching in the public schools. So there you go. I don't know if this is still happening in schools, but before a science class starts their uh, little teaching run on evolution, they they present uh, some sort of printed document saying this is only a theory or something like that. Isn't that right? Something almost like, almost like a disclaimer. There have been uh, states around the United States, Alabama being the most uh, egregious, mm -hmm. and at one point Texas, that uh, required um, uh, disclaimers to be put in textbooks. In uh, Dover, Pennsylvania, the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial, the, the um, teachers were supposed to read a disclaimer, and that was one of the reasons why they uh, uh, objected so strongly to uh, the uh, Dover School Board policy because they, they mm -hmm. just did not want to do that. They, the teachers were great in, in, in Dover. They were wonderful. Um, they, thus, I, I do not know of any school district that requires that, although the Alabama uh, textbooks still do require a um, a, uh, a milder disclaimer than they had in the in the past, and uh, fortunately that um, unfortunately that does continue. There are teachers who will sometimes um, uh, start a lesson on evolution uh, by shall we say defusing the religion issue um and and this is this is i, I this is this is appropriate in certain and certain classes um if you if a if a teacher has a lot of conservative christian students in the class and this is the case in many parts of the country it is entirely appropriate to say, well, you know, there are a lot of different uh, views about evolution in our society. Um, here's what's, you know, we're going to be talking about what scientists uh, uh, have found to be the case with evolution. And, uh, but there are some people who object to evolution on religious grounds, but this is not a uniform position in Christianity. In fact, I even developed a, an, a classroom exercise called the Creation Evolution Continuum which you can find on the uh, NCSC website. If you just go to the website and go to the search and type in continuum, it'll pop up. And many teachers have found this to be very, very useful. What the continuum exercise does is it makes it very, very, very clear that it is not the job of the teacher to try to change the student's religious beliefs. That's not the job. It's inappropriate. But it is the... Uh, it is important for the teacher not to slam shut the door to a student being able to make his or her own accommodation to uh, evolution and that student's religious beliefs. And it's perfectly appropriate for the teacher to educate the student about a variety of choices within Christian theology. And that's basically what the uh, creation evolution continuum does. It walks the student through the most extreme of the creation who are the flat earthers, uh, through uh, the geocentrists, through the young earthers, through the old earthers, through the theistic evolutionists, through the materialist evolutionists. So it goes through the whole gamut of, of Christian religion and, and with materialists at the bottom of philosophical view. Um, and, you know, basically just describes them and leaves it there. Uh, the teacher is instructed very clearly not to say, and these guys are right, and these guys are idiots. 
the exercise makes it clear to teachers that they are just to describe these positions, not to um, take a position on the position, uh, not, not to advocate for any particular position. Oh, you know, you should really be a theistic evolutionist or you should really be a young earth creationist. You know, describe the positions and let the students um, make up their own mind about their, you know, religious views. Uh, and it's, you know, I've, I've had teachers... Um, uh, I've had teachers tell me that it's been extremely helpful for, for getting the fingers out of the ears, so to speak, so the student is willing to at least listen to what the teacher is saying about evolution. And, and you, know, you know, the greatest tribute uh, that I got in hmm. the, um, uh, in, in the you know, use of the creation evolution continuum by teachers is that I was attending a National Science Teachers Association meeting and I saw on the program that a teacher was giving a talk about the use of the creation evolution continuum. So I thought, hmm, that sounds familiar. I'll go to that. <laughs> and, so, and so I went to the uh, presentation by the teacher and I sat in the back of the room so, you know, I would be very um, uh, inobtrusive. And it was wonderful because the teacher walked the students through the exercise, um, mentioned, um, uh, you know, how you should and should not use it, and uh, mentioned how useful it had been in his own classroom to uh, help the students relax more about uh, learning evolution. And um, I couldn't have been happier to, to see that happen. I don't think he actually mentioned uh, who had developed the creation evolution continuum. That didn't bother me at all. He said, I got this from the NCSE website. So, that, yeah, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Would you say it's almost like a, uh, a disclaimer, which is like been brought out because of the disclaimer that everyone else had to, to cope with before, if you see what I mean? A disclaimer That's to um, rival the other disclaimer. Well, it clear. I mean, the crea my my little simple creation evolution continuum exercise is clearly a response to anti evolutionism. You don't need it unless you've got a unless you're in a country that has a lot of uh, opposition to evolution. I, I'm sure that this is not something that you're likely to run into in France. They're they're not. You know, this isn't a big deal. Japan, um, but if you have a uh, school district where uh, you have a lot of conservative Protestant Christian students, it doesn't hurt to kind of clear the air a little bit as to, mm. well, you know, you can, you know, there are people who are Christians who accept evolution. This is a new thing to a lot of conservative Protestant Christian kids. All they've heard thus far is that evolution is an evil idea, that if you believe evolution, and it's always mm. a matter of belief, right? Not it's not, Almost it's not like it's an evil you know, ideology. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Evolution is presented as an evil ideology that's going to draw you away from religion and uh, make you give up your faith in God and the Bible, and that way it goes, it leads to ruin in terms it of promotes their atheism. beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, but atheism is a terrible uh, is a terrible thing for these people. If you give up your mm -hmm. faith, that means you will not be saved after you after you die. You will not rejoin your loved ones after death. This is a you know this is a big deal for for people who have these beliefs. You will not become one with God. That's a real biggie. Um, so there's the whole salvation issue that they believe is at risk if a student learns evolution. There's also the issue of um, moral uh, and uh, ethical behavior. They, they believe that unless you have the, they, they believe the Bible is the only guide for morals and ethics. And that if you don't have the Bible, you will simply run rampant and you know, rape and steal and lie and full spindle and mutilate and, and be a terrible person, which obviously isn't the case. I haven't killed anybody in weeks. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but, but such is, you know, I, I do take these beliefs, I mean, I joked about it right now, but I do take these beliefs seriously. And, you know, how do you assuage that concern? Well, First of all, um, there are evangelical Christians who accept evolution. It's not just Catholics and Methodists and Presbyterians and folks like that. There are conservative Christians who have managed to accommodate evolution to their religious beliefs. And I think it's just a matter of education that conservative Christian students should know about this and be able to make up their own mind what to do about it. 
But right now, they're operating from ignorance. Mm. They don't know that this is an option within even conservative Christianity. So I'll tell people about groups like the American Scientific Affiliation, which is ASA3.org, or BioLogos Foundation, BioLogos.org, which um, have a variety of views, but a very strong uh, component is love of science and how you can uh, embrace science and be a conservative Christian. And even evolution within science is possible from their perspective theological perspective and they are you know they are born again they are conservative christians they believe in a personal relationship with jesus all the things that you can check off on the conservative christian theological checklist but they still accept evolution so it's good for people to understand this and that's amazing this well. idea that uh, perhaps god kicked off the whole evolutionary process and and some of them go further than that with god is more than just a first mover that's actually a, um you know a fairly common view within christianity in general um some i mean i mean it, it, this is not a this is not a simple uh theological position that can be expressed in one mm. or two you know sense, no. sentences of paragraph there's a huge variety even within the view called theistic evolution which is you know mainstream christianity i mean and and the major axes has has the major axis has to do with how involved is god if you have a kind of a deistic point of view uh, where God has basically just flips the switch and sets all the rules of nature and lets things tick along. Um, that's um, you know that's the 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 most extreme, as it were, on uh, one side of theistic evolution. On the far side, on the other direction, you have a very interventionist God who is in there tinkering around with the uh, the DNA of every individual and producing the kind of individual that God wants that person to be which is a uh you know a, a, yeah that that is that is clearly an extreme form of, of interventionism mm. but everything in between and you know christians will find themselves on that continuum uh in one way or another but just knowing that it's possible to be a quote good christian as they would call themselves and accept evolution is important uh, because uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of conservative Christians who reject evolution, and it sort of slides over into rejecting science as well. Although most conservative Christians, certainly the ones I'm most familiar with and the materials I've read, think science is great. They're they're not anti science at all, but they're anti this science, and that's the distinction. They exactly. think that, that evolution is bad science, so it should be taken out of the canon of science. But science in general is fine. They're, they're more than happy with having their kids learn science. And they're, they like the technology and the medical care and, you know. Exactly what I've noticed. Yeah, yeah. If it's evolutionary science or something connected to it, like radiometric dating, it's faulty. Mm -hmm. But their mobile phones are fine. Great science. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, they like the, um, the benefits of medical technology and oh, yeah. medical science. They like being healthy. They like, uh, you know, they tend to inoculate their kids. They're not anti-vaxxers. Um, but it's just that they don't accept evolution as sound science. And, of course, that's a product of the efforts of the largely the young Earth creationists over mm. many, many decades, hammering away at evolution being weak science as you know from having read so much of their literature. Well, you've confronted and debated quite a few famous creationists over the years, including Ken Ham, creator of the Ark Park and the Creation Museum, as well as Kent Hovind. Now, you must have some favorite memories of your clashes with these guys that you can, <laughs> that you can talk about. Well, I, I, I would first want to make a, a very brief nomenclatural cor uh, correction because I don't debate in the in the formal sense of debate. Mm. I will appear with a creationist, like on a interview show, or um, a TV show, or something like that, where where there can be something of a back and forth. Uh, but formal debates, uh, I have always argued against and really discouraged scientists from engaging in them because the setup just is not conducive to either persuading people that evolution is good science or countering 
the problems, uh, the, the claims that the, that the creationists come up with. Um, right. on, on my tombstone, uh, there probably is going to be carved, you know, inventor of the gish gallop, uh, <laughs> the phrase gish gallop, <laughs> <laughs> which I coined to describe the technique that creationists use in debating, which is to um, issue a talk and talk torrent, and talk. <laughs> a torrent of, of misinformation that the poor debate opponent, uh, the evolutionist, has no hope of countering in the amount of time allowed. So I do not debate. Okay, so just, just to be sure. I believe that creationist views should be countered, and I have done that publicly, um, but a formal debate setting is not the way to do it. So what have I found fun about doing this? Well, not a whole lot's fun. There's but, a couple I'm thinking uh, of. I'm hoping you're going to hit on, hit on them, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, one of the one of the most interesting experiences I ever had was uh, doing a program with the BBC. Um, there, it was one of the radio programs. The program involved uh, I and uh, Henry Morris the Third traveling around the country, interviewing people about evolution and about their religion. And I interviewed scientists, and Henry the Third interviewed creationists which was really, you know, which was so much better than, than what they wanted to do to start mm. with, which was, you know, let's you, and, let's you and him fight because that's kind of the general press narrative. They, you know. But I said, no, you, you know, creation and evolution, it's been done. It's boring. Why don't you have us go and talk to people about religion? And then, oh, that's different. So it was really fun. But one of the people I got to interview was Ken Ham. Oh, yeah. And so... <laughs> Uh, he, you know, the advance work, um, his people didn't quite make it completely clear to him what was going on. Mm. Uh, so when we sat down, he had his science staff kind of in the, you know, surrounding us almost like, well, if she asks a question about science, I'll just ask him and he'll, you know, supply the astronomy or, you know. and so I could tell that there's something, you know, he, he clearly didn't understand what the purpose of this interview was. So, mm. What I did was start off our discussion by saying, well, you know, we're not here to debate creation and evolution. And it looked a little disappointed, but there you have it. I said, we're here to talk about your religious beliefs, because I think this is a very interesting question. You know, what is it that you believe, and you know, how is this guided what you've done here at the Creation Museum? This was several years ago before the Art Park. And he mm -hmm. kind of blinked a few times, but once he figured out, oh, okay, that's what we're doing. It was absolutely fascinating because basically he um, he launched forth with this description of his religious beliefs and why evolution is so important to him. And I found it absolutely fascinating. I had to do very little interviewing because he just poured forth his heart on why evolution was such a terrible idea. Um, and you could, know, you, how could you sympathize a bit after that? Well, you know, I always, I mean, I, I let, I, I'm not a religious person, I'm a humanist, so I let other religious people debate the, the value of somebody else's religious views, because I don't have a dog in that fight. But I, I certainly understood him better, um, and I understood why mm. he feels so strongly about uh trying to turn especially children away from evolution in a nutshell um it's because children are going to if they if they quote believe quote evolution they will stop believing in god they will stop believing in the bible they will go to hell and not be reunited with God at the end times, nor will they ever see their beloved family members again, nor will their family members see them, which is a very, a very big issue. Uh, and uh, they will not have the moral guidance that the Bible provides. It's like a deal breaker, it's, I guess. It's, it is, I mean, it is, it is totally unacceptable from that point of view for evolution to be correct. Because they believe that that evolution results in a cascade of disaster for young people, so they fight very, very hard to keep it from happening. Dr. Scott, are creationist organizations like the Discovery Institute, 
legally able to produce creationism and intelligent design textbooks. And where exactly does ID stand now in the United States uh, and in the world? Well, it's absolutely legal for them to uh, produce whatever uh, stuff they want. I mean, we consider it to be scientifically seriously flawed and an effort to try to uh, get, you know, religion into the public schools. But, you know, we, we have freedom of speech and uh, the freedom of religion in this country, so knock yourself out. And we will oppose them as much as we can and try to keep them from succeeding in, in um, getting their views into the public schools. I haven't heard much about much from the Discovery Institute uh, in the last several years. They seem to have kind of settled in to a um, fairly modest uh, effort. They are churning out... Uh, pretty much the same views that they've expressed previously they've got a you know a, a modest uh, web presence where they uh, post various blog entries from uh, their uh, staff and fellows and and uh, people affiliated with them the occasional book comes out from time to time but nothing really new has come out of intelligent design since well quite frankly the books that they produced in the late 90s and 2000s. I mean, you know, the, the, hmm. uh, they will disagree with me, but my opinion is that the basic position of intelligent design is evolution is wrong. And <laughs> there, there's not a lot that you can, that you can say if, if that's your message. Uh, it's an uphill battle. Uh, but do you notice that they have right. over the, I've noticed they seem to be accommodating things like uh, a long time ago, you know, dinosaurs were, they weren't real. Now they're really accommodating, you know, the humans wrote in the back of dinosaurs. Now there's, you know, are they accepting that, oh yeah, dinosaurs had feathers and they might even, even accommodate mm -hmm. the idea of human evolution, but still within the context of, you know, God is in control and God started it all off. Well, the intelligent design people have never fussed very much about age of the earth or dinosaurs and humans living together. They they kind of, most of them are not young earthers. There's really only a smattering of young earth creationists who kind of jumped on the ID bandwagon when it uh, took off in the mid-2000s. Um, I'm not even sure they're still affiliated, frankly. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, they're, they're, they're fine with stuff like you know, dinosaurs having feathers. I mean, that doesn't that doesn't challenge their worldview in any way. Um, these are the, the the major objection that the ID people have is uh, primarily the mechanism of natural selection, which, of course, as Darwin demonstrated and has been demonstrated ever since, is a natural way of explaining adaptation. Adaptation is a tough problem in for living things. I mean, how is it that living things are so well adapted to their environments? The classic design argument uh, from William Paley up until the present day Discovery Institute proponents is that God specially designed creatures to uh, function well in their particular environments. But of course, what natural selection says is that there is a natural explanation for how organisms are well adapted to their environment. And of course, natural selection is a superior explanation because it also helps to explain why mm. there's all these really kludgy things that go on in uh, organisms adapted to their environment. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that kind of work works well enough, but not very well at all. Uh, but still, the organism manages to hang in there, so it continues to survive. Uh, design and natural selection are um, can compete for really good design, but only evolution, only natural selection explains crappy design. <laughs> so that is, is a consideration the intelligent design people haven't used. But their major concern really is natural selection as a natural explanation, which they believe mm -hmm. removes God as a direct agent from um, human um, adaptation, but also human nature, human um, 
success, human uh, survival, etc. And they really don't, they're conservative Christians, um, mostly Protestant, but some Catholics. And their view is that God has to be an active agent in the world. And of course, evolution, as any science, stresses natural processes rather than supernatural processes. And that's the thing that they can't stomach. So they really, they're okay with dinosaurs having feathers. They're okay. Vast majority of them are okay with an ancient age of the earth. They just don't like God being removed as a direct agent, uh, tinkering around with uh, organisms to produce um, the diversity of creatures we see today, and especially human beings. So they, what they fear, I guess you could say, is the, the, the possible chaos of the whole thing rather than it being guided by somebody with a plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea of, yeah, it's kind of interesting because it's almost like they're back in the 1700s where mm -hmm. uh, nature was viewed as chaotic and um, uh, undirected uh, and uh, lacking purpose and lacking um, any sort of agency, as it were. Um, whereas God was 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 organized, was purposeful, was directive, and had everything under control. Whereas nature was just this this chaotic mess. And of course, as science grew during the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, present. <laughs> Um, you know, we find that there is a there's great organization to nature, uh, not just in the physical and chemical, but also in the biological realms uh, and ecological realms. I mean, all kind of all levels at which you want to look at uh, at uh, nature. Uh, and this organization, this these regularities, what you might call laws and theories, these regularities of nature do not require an external creator to either um, originate or to man maintain and this is uh, it, it is the ma the materialism of science which is and of evolution particularly which the intelligent design people uh, deny and fight so hard against and note please is something that i've hammered away at to, to people's um, boredom for decades i'm talking about a methodological mechan mechanism of science, not a uh, inherent philosophical uh, materialism. Many scientists are materialists. They do not believe that there is any kind of supernatural or guiding force in nature, and that's fine. I'm one of them. But that materialist philosophical point of view is not required by science. All that is required by science is that you use and restrict yourself to natural processes in explaining and understanding nature. Otherwise, you're not doing science. And of course, this is where the intelligent design people uh, just absolutely uh, flip out because that's part and parcel of their whole perspective. Well, there's so much I would like to ask you, and maybe <laughs> one day in the future you can come on to the show again and perhaps talk in detail about the Kitzmiller trial. Uh, what do you think? I'd be delighted. I can bore people for hours with Kitzmiller. I love <laughs> I love talking about Kitzmiller. There's so many little little funny things that happened off stage that um, that uh, uh, are fun to, to to talk about, and I believe are fun for people to listen to also. Yeah, there is that two hour documentary they did. Uh, I've seen a yeah. couple of times, but yeah. even that doesn't scratch the surface of. Uh, uh, I'm sure of everything that uh, that happened on those days. Oh no! I mean, one uh, Nicholas Smatsky was working for me at the time. He's since become a very well-known uh, biogeographer, PhD scientist. He's working in New mm -hmm. Zealand now. Nick Matsky came up uh, with um, an interesting little graphic for the lawyers, like the day or so before we were going to start this um, the, the trial. He said, "Well, this this might be useful for showing the uh, the uh, the judge how the uh, term creationism." changed over time in the various editions of the book that became of pandas and people mm -hmm. and uh, there was one point where the two lines crossed and that was the year that the supreme court came up with the um, uh, decision that outlawed the teaching of creation science in the public schools and the lawyers just sort of looked at each other like th there was this oh shit <laughs> 
moment where they thought, <laughs> we're, we're, we're going to build our testimony around this graphic. I mean, it, was just, it was just something that, you know, Nick being this kind of really, really good data sort of guy, I mean, he just kind of crunched some numbers the night before and came up with this really good graphic, which has become famous now. Anyway, mm -hmm. there's lots of little stories like that that I could talk about. <laughs> Well, I'll leave links to your social media in the description below, along with links to your books, Evolution versus Creationism, and Not in Our Classrooms, Why Intelligent Design is Wrong for Our Schools. Thank but you. before we sign off, uh, what have you got planned that you can tell us about? A, I don't know, a lecture tour, podcast appearance maybe, or uh, perhaps there's another uh, book in the works? Well, um, I have been... Uh, encouraged for a number of years and and it is my plan to write a memoir because there's mm. so many little funny stories like that that are kind of uh, bobbing around in in this very unusual job that i had for 27 years of directing ncse and so that is something that is definitely on my list but i need to get myself organized to do it and if you I, do your memoir will you mention growing up christian science i wonder because that would be fascinating <laughs> to people it, it was a short period of time, but it certainly was something that was important in, uh, in uh, some, of the ways, uh, some of the ways I was raised. And, uh, but I tell you, when the polio vaccine came along, uh, uh, my mother got us vaccinated. The little boy next door who was my age was paralyzed from the neck down. Nothing gets your attention faster than seeing what mm. a lack of vaccines will do. So there you have it. Christians, Christian scientists basically don't go to the doctor, just pray about it. Oh, no, that's exactly it. Um, my mother was not a strong Christian science, but she did come from that background. And basically, we never went to the doctor. Somehow I survived, but a whole lot of kids who don't go to the doctor don't. Wow. So I don't recommend it. Um, I'm available for lectures. I, you mentioned the Croatia meeting. I, I had a wonderful time talking to other scientists in Croatia. I'll be doing a... Um, a talk in uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area at the Exploratorium, which is a wonderful science museum, uh, where very hands-on, very very experimental. It's really a fun place. Um, I've got other you know talks uh, coming up, I assume. Um, anyway, um, I enjoy it, and I'm I'm happy to continue doing it as long as people are still interested in anything I, you know, in, in my views and my opinions and my information on this matter so sure i think they happy always to... will <laughs> maybe um but i'm happy to do so right thank you so much dr scott that was absolutely fascinating and hopefully we'll speak to you again sometime in the future thank you very much for asking me mark i had a lot of fun <laughs> <laughs>